Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so installing rooftop solar. So I'm gonna, as I said earlier, I'm gonna turn my video off. If you've got any questions, we'd be really happy uh, for you to put them into the uh, into the chat function. Uh, we've got some people in the background here answering questions tonight. Um, just to you know put a bit of perspective in this, I've been living with solar and batteries for 18 years in this house. Uh, so I'm off grid uh, and I've done quite a bit of work installing as well as many thousands of energy assessments. I've been into many homes and understand a lot of people's concerns about energy and how they use power. So um, from my own experience, uh, I'm able to provide a bit of uh, a bit of a bit of detail here tonight. But we're going to get through quite a bit of information, so I'm going to keep moving a little bit quickly. So here we go. Um, so I'd like to explain a little bit about who we are, the Australian Energy Foundation. So our organisation is often referred to as a not-for-profit organisation, but we consider ourselves a for-purpose organisation, and our goal is to really lead the way towards an equitable zero-carbon society. That's that's really what we're pushing. Uh, across uh, you know, our, 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 works, our work goals. Um, tonight, we're going to go through three sort of topic areas. So why install solar? How to get the right system? And what about battery storage? Let's get on the way with why install solar. I'm also going to ask for a little bit of input here from everybody. So we're going to quickly run a poll. Um, the polls uh, are just short. Uh, the idea is to sort of get a bit of an idea of, uh, actually, I don't seem to have the control over that here and now. Uh, so perhaps I'm unable to ask you to <laughs> give us some feedback on a poll. Uh, it's not coming up. Say again. We'll just keep, uh, we'll have to keep moving. I'm not seeing that uh, function available on my screen. So um, let's have a look at, uh, let's have a look at the, the next slide, which is all about why Australia is in uh, a bit of a solar boom. There's been a number of different things that have sort of really driven the uh, energy, um, the growth in renewable energy and solar power in the last few years. And you can see from this uh, graphic that, you know, in Australia, we've got great take up and some of our states are in front. You know, there are really sunny states such as Western Australia and Queensland and South Australia, which are really booming for it. So there's been some incentives in those states as well that have really encourage it along. But what, what I can say is that across the whole country, over two and a half million homes now have solar installed. Uh, and what you can see is even just from, you know, the year 2020, um, three gigawatts was installed. That's a 40% increase in renewable energy added to the market. Uh, and so when you have a look at New South Wales, uh, we're a fairly big player population wise, aren't we? 25.8%. Um, uh, and I think, you know, that's a great number. Uh, would I like to see more? Well, um, the answer is yes. I think there's room for improvement there. Uh, and when we look at the sort of councils, uh, our local councils here, Randwick, Waverley and Mullar, you can see that there's, you know, fairly good uptake. Uh, I, I say to myself, there's also, you know, uh, room for expansion. So um, let's learn about how that can happen. Hey, James, a different question you can turn your camera on and off. Getting some sound there. If people can, if people, if, if anyone's there, uh, if they're able to mute themselves, that would be helpful. Um, so why has solar become so popular? There's a couple of factors here. Number one is that photovoltaics, the actual ma the materials and the production of photovoltaics has dropped significantly. So I installed solar 18 years ago. My panels cost about thousand dollars each. Today, modern solar panels, you know, produce you know twice to three times the amount of power, and they cost something like a quarter than what they do, what they did, you know, back then. Uh, what we've seen just in the last five years is a 58% drop. So it's really large scale manufacturing has really driven down the cost of solar. Uh, so the, you know, at one point in time, uh, the photovoltaic industry was competing with the silicon uh, market using computers, but today separate entities and large scale production. So the, the actual devices that produce the electricity are vastly cheaper uh, and also more efficient. And you can see here from the sort of chart on the right there, the sort of graphs, um, you know, we're seeing that renewable energy is really starting to pick up in its, uh, in its in, as a player in the annual electricity generation market. I mean, we're now seeing, you know, in occasionally states like South Australia really booming uh, insofar as the production of uh, you know, renewable energy. Um, and so, you know, we have days where, you know, South Australia's you know, actually you know, completely covered its own energy use. Um, so that kind of uh, progress is only going to continue. And, you know, when you look at the percentage of the actual percentages of renewable um, by technology, uh, wind is a very big player and, you know, small scale solar is just growing and growing. Hydro has been there for a long time. We're going to see that added to, and there's great potential there. Uh, and of course, large scale solar is, you know, it's really starting to take off too. Bioenergy, small player, medium scale solar, still a fairly small player. 
basically solar leads to really great returns. And the idea here is um, Curtin University has given us a graph here. It talks about the sort of amount of uh, energy you can save. They talk about a sort of, uh, you know, on a sort of statistical average of households that might be using, say, something like 25 kilowatts per hour. They say if you install a five kilowatt system, you're going to save something in the order of about $1,000 a year uh, on your electricity bills. And that's going to you know, recover the cost of your investment fairly quickly. Uh, look, and I can assure you that you can do better than that. If you've got good solar access to your roof, then you can do much better than, than those figures. And you know, my advice to you is if you uh, have a look at the stats and have a look at the options and talk to a few suppliers, uh, you'll find that you can probably even zero your electricity bill if the sunlight's available on your roof and you've got a bit of budget to pay for it. Um, what I'd really like you to focus on is the payback time. We're talking sort of three to five years in Sydney uh, in order to recover the investment of installing solar. And that's what makes it such a powerful proposition is you can actually fully recover the money that you outlay in a, a, such a short time frame, and then the solar power panels um, and the inverter, that, that technology is going to continue to to function for many years on. So my system's been running for 18 years and it's been, you know, my panels have just been producing power seamlessly. And my expectation is that any panels that you put on your roof today are going to run past 20 years. That's the, they sort of tend to run past 25 years and beyond. Um, there's a few variables that actually you know, alter that sort of payback time. And those variables are the amount of sunlight available, the prices you negotiate with your energy supplier, the cost of the system you buy, whether you're buying the really expensive units or the really cheap units, which I would avoid, uh, or the, and the amount of self-consumption. So how much power you use that you produce really reduces that payback time and brings it down to that sort of three year window, which is really great. Uh, the position of the panels can make an impact too. Um, the sort of catch all phrase at the bottom there, expect to save 30 to 60% off electricity bills with solar. Uh, but my advice is the really well sized system, you can probably get closer to, you know, really reducing your bills by 100% if you work hard at it. Uh, how does solar work? This is a really elementary graphic. Um, I'm only going to step through this pretty briefly just to give everybody the basics. But number one, in order for this system to work, you need sunlight. Uh, now, fortunately, you know, we've been swimming around uh, the uh, our, our solar system, swinging around the sun for uh, billions of years, and that's a known trajectory, and it's going to continue for billions of years ahead. You can measure any square meter of sunlight on the earth and sort of you know, predict how much energy you can get from that. Now, uh, solar panels need sunlight. They're not looking for heat. Heat produces hot water in solar hot water systems, but solar panels or photovoltaic panels need photons. They need light to make electricity. So we've got a pretty good uh, you know, idea of how much energy is produced in our region. And so, so long as we've got uh, you know, sunlight pouring onto these solar panels, they're gonna generate electricity. They won't work at night, only during the day. And how do they work? There's a couple of layers of silicon. One, one layer is dosed with a particular chemical, chemical. The second layer dosed with a different one. As photons pass through, electrons are shed and then you capture them with a small electrical grid. And that brings the electricity down from the solar panels where you can use it in your home. But initially it has to go through item number three, an inverter. The inverter's job is fairly simple. It just changes from DC current to AC. And AC is the current that we use in our homes, 240 volt, 230 volt, 220 volt AC, that kind of range is what we use. So the inverter does the job of converting the DC over to AC, and then it brings it down to your switchboard uh, where you can use it in various appliances. If you're not using the power that you've generated, it'll get counted by your meter, and then the electricity goes out to the grid and somebody else gets to use that electricity. So that's the basic flow. Uh, this is changing a little bit because there are some varying technologies here. And I'll describe some of those as we go along a bit further tonight. But that's the basic flow. You need sunlight. Uh, you don't want hot weather. You actually want cool weather and sunlight. That's when they perform at their best. How do you save money? How do you recover the money as a result? Well, basically, when you generate your own electricity, you're no longer having to buy it in. And that can be costing you sort of in the order of about 30 cents per kilowatt hour, sometimes a bit more depending on your time of use tariffs, uh, and sometimes a bit less depending on, you know, you know, how you've negotiated with your power companies. But the electricity that you don't use when you generate solar that goes out to the grid, it attracts a tariff. You earn money for that. That's called a feed-in tariff. And the feed-in tariffs typically are fairly low. We're talking sort of five to, cent, five to 10 cents for each kilowatt hour of energy that you produce. You can shop around and get a little bit better than that. And there's been great variation in that over the last uh, sort of five or six to eight years. Uh, but, you know, today we're looking at five to, cent, five to 10 cents is sort of average prices. So the outcome is 
if you're selling the electricity out to the grid, you're only going to earn a small amount compared to what you would be buying it in for. And that difference is sort of two to three times the amount. So using the energy you produce, that's how you pay your system off quickly. And there's a few different tools that you can use to really help you to achieve that. So today, uh, you know, there are a lot of smart appliances. There's a lot of controls, smart homes. Uh, you can have all sorts of devices that you can, you know, preset timer functions onto and get them running at, you know, whatever time of day suits you. And we sort of understand that already. For instance, if someone's got a pool, they've probably got some sort of timer that turns the pool pump on and off. Uh, well, you can actually apply that kind of thinking. Once you install solar, um, you tend to find, you gravitate towards wanting to make the, the most of it. And so, you know, you can use something as simple as these little kind, you know, very simple kind of, this is a digital timer. The idea is it just allows you to set a timer for something. So typically we might come home from work, we might make some dinner, we put the dishes in the in the in the dishwasher and we you know load up the suds and press start. Well, if you've got solar power, people tend to load up the suds, but they don't press start. They set it on a timer so that it goes off tomorrow morning at nine or 10 o'clock in the morning when the sun's in their panels. Um, and the same can apply for the, the dishwasher as the washing machine, as dryers and all of those other sort of larger appliances in our homes. Um, so, you know, some people apply them to air conditioners and that way they can preheat or pre-cool their homes. And so you're really maximizing the energy that you're producing. Uh, so the idea here is particularly to talk about something like hot water, there's an area in which there's been some growth in technology. And also a great way for you to store your solar power is actually to tip that energy into a hot water system. So I've got a graph here which shows you a number of different types of hot water systems. And you can see the sort of annual running costs of those hot water systems. So gas has always, you know, it's been pretty popular, but, you know, the significant price there, $400 a year, um, it's costing almost, you know, a bit over a dollar a day. Uh, gas instantaneous is about a dollar a day. That's not too bad. Uh, electric storage. So a classic, simple electric storage hot water system. You know, it's significantly more expensive. Uh, gas with a solar boost. Now, that's been pretty cheap over time. But what we are seeing is the price of any kind of fossil fuels. But generally, gas is actually fetching a higher and higher price. So it may be time for us to review those sort of uh, those kind of uh, fuels. Um, solar with electric boost, you know, that still seems pretty affordable at $350 per annum. Um, however, you're actually buying two hot water systems because in Sydney, we only tend to get about hot water for about sort of six to eight months of the year. And then we're using our backup electric booster in that instance for the other months of the year. So, you know, what a lot of people do, are doing today is they're replacing their hot water systems with heat pump hot water systems. And it's a device that operates a bit like a fridge. It has a compressor, a refrigerant gas. It's a canister that holds heat and releases cool into the atmosphere. And it does that using a sort of heat exchanger, that heat pump technology. Um, and so you can see from the prices there, the heat pump uh, hot water system uh, is really going to be the most commonly installed hot water system in the future. And it's a great place that you can then tip your solar power into to give you hot water throughout the day uh, via your heat pump hot water system. Really efficient. Those uh, devices use something in the order of a quarter to a third of the electricity of a classic hot water system. Uh, we've got a guide on our website. We'd really encourage you to take a look at the, our website to have a look at those guides. You can download them, aef.com.au for home hot water. So if you're interested in following that up and your hot water system's a few years old, please take a look at those guides. All right, let's talk about how to get the right system for solar. What are the things that you're going to be, you know, we need to understand. We need to understand panels and inverters, size of systems, price of systems, position and suppliers. Let's learn about those. Um, I'm just going to point out quickly in this picture, I've done this kind of work where you, where you carry panels up onto roofs. There's a chap up there with his hard hat on and his harness um, carrying a solar panel. And he's also, you can see this sort of aluminium rails and things. Just to give you a bit of an idea, just on the practical side, it takes about a day to install a typical sized system uh, with a couple of skilled workers. You know, it may be an electrician and a, and a skilled offsider. Um, sometimes there are teams that do it a little quicker than that. But in, in, in about a day, you can have the system installed on your roof, plus maybe a follow-up day where there's some extra electrical work done around the inverter. Uh, yeah, so there's a bit of an example of what it looks like when someone's moving around on your roof. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about panels, inverters, size, price, position, and supplier. So to begin with, solar panels. Now, uh, to understand a little bit about them, uh, photovoltaic panels, as I 
talked about earlier, uh, you know, they need sunlight to operate. And the way that you actually make these panels varies a little bit. Uh, insofar as how they use the silicon inside them. Uh, and so they tend to be sort of divided up into either monocrystalline or polycrystalline sort of structures. Um, it's not really that important about how that operates today. Uh, once upon a time, there was a slight difference. It's actually about the way they slice the silicon and put it under there. But basically, most panels are very efficient, whether they're monocrystalline or polycrystalline. But panels today, an individual panel will produce about anywhere between sort of 350 and 400 watts is what you'll typically get as a panel off the shelf. Now, a few years ago, when I was installing panels, a typical solar panel was about a 250 watt panel. And so just to give you an example, to install a small system, you might be putting eight 200, 250 watt panels on your roof. So 250 watts times by eight gives you 2000. That's a two kilowatt system. So the solar panels will generate two kilowatts when the sun's on them. Uh, if you wanted a bigger system, and this is what's been going on in the last few years and continuing to go on, is that the panels are actually, one, they've gotten a little bigger, but also they're, they're more efficient. So they actually just generate more electricity in the same sort of footprint. Uh, so, you know, modern panels, you know, from just a year or so back are around the sort of 300 and 330 watt sort of range. Today's panels are more like 350 to 400 watts. Now, so insofar as sizing a system, you simply add up the number of panels based on how much solar power you can generate off a, off a panel, how much electricity is coming off the panel. Uh, and so, you know, typical systems today are in that sort of 6.6 .6 kilowatt range. You see that advertised and it's a really neat package uh, for salespeople to sell. 20, 330 watt panels, that's 6,600 watts worth of production or a 6.6 .6 kilowatt system. There's one more factor that we need to know. Oh, well, two more factors. One, how big are they? Well, the panels that you're looking at there, typically they're about a meter wide. They're a bit less than two meters tall. They tend to be about sort of 1,800 millimeters, 1 1.8 meters tall. Um, some of the really big ones are actually getting too big for, you know, laborers to carry up on the roof. So, uh, you know, they've, they've tried to keep them in that sort of footprint size about, a meter wide and a bit less than two meters tall. So if you're looking at how much space is available on your roof, then you can start doing some figures based on that. You know, if you're installing a typical, say, you know, six or 6.6 .6 kilowatt system, then you're gonna need about 20 panels. That'll be 10 meters wide by about, you know, less than four meters deep, you know, that kind of thing. But there's one other factor that I need to discuss just really briefly, how many hours of energy do they produce each day? Well, on average in Sydney, it's about 3.9 hours. So for simplicity, for today, just for simplicity, just imagine that these panels are producing about four hours worth of energy each day. And if you put, say, a five kilowatt system on your roof and it's producing for four hours a day, you multiply those two figures, you end up with about 20 kilowatt hours. And that's around about what the New South Wales average is, the average home uses. So just to give you a bit of an idea, a typical home would be, you know, a sensible size would be about five kilowatts. Um, you know, big, if, bigger, if you're planning to be all electric in the future, perhaps an electric car, 6.6 .6 might be a better goal or even higher. Uh, a small system for a unit or flat uh, might be, you know, two or, or townhouse, two kilowatts or three kilowatts, if it's only a small uh, footprint or size available. So you may end up buying a few less panels. What do you look for when you consider those panels? So basically there's a couple of different kinds of warranty and you'll sometimes see the advertising can be a little misleading. Um, there's a, a thing called the performance warranty and that's really talking about how much electricity that the panel is designed to generate over its lifetime, its operating lifetime. And so performance warranty talks about, they, they draw graphs and curves, uh, curves on graphs um, in order to demonstrate uh, how long you expect a solar panel to operate for. And typically, uh, most of the solar panels sold in Australia uh, will offer you a 25 year performance warranty. Some a little more, some a little less, but 25 year warranty is pretty typical performance warranty. And what that means is that on day one, it'll be producing the amount of electricity that's stated on the, on the panel, uh, on the compliance plate at the back, 300 watts, 350 watts, whatever it might be. But by the time you get out to about sort of 12, somewhere between eight and 12 years, the power starts to diminish a little bit. You'll get a little bit less from that solar panel from there on. And by the time you get out to 25 years, the solar panel will still be outputting 80% of its original output. And so, you know, they have these enormous long lifespans. Uh, the, comp the companies are so confident that they will offer those great long performance warranties. But that's a little different to really one of the criteria that you need to employ when you're choosing them. 
And the criteria you really need to employ is product warranty, because there are some panels that offer much smaller product warranties, only five years or seven years, in which case they're saying the aluminium frames, the silicon joints, the cabling, the UV protection, the, the, actual, the actual connectors that join panels together, those items are only going to be offered on cheaper panels with a lower warranty of less than 10 years. And we would recommend you really want to be going for those product warranty goals at least 10 years. No, no less than 10 years. Uh, and then, of course, you want to be trying to choose reputable brands. Um, look, this is a list that comes from an organization called Solar Quotes, uh, and they do a lot of good advice. There's a lot of solar panels on the market, a lot of different players. So it's not a comprehensive list, but it gives you an idea that there's a number of players that are sort of in that market. And you can see up the left-hand side is brand name, uh, but to the right, it's entry level and up to top end. And I would say, you know, most of those solar panels are going to give you a good performance over the lifetime. I want to talk briefly about inverters. Now, this is the device that actually takes the DC power from the solar panels and changes it to, you know, inverts it to AC power, that sort of, uh, you know, sine wave that we get coming through our, uh, our power supply through our power points and, you know, running through our households. So there's a slight change in this technology. And typically what you've seen in the past is what's up, represented up in the blue box on the top right-hand corner there. So you've got a row of solar panels and they're connected together and then they're joined into wires to an inverter, a string inverter or central inverter. And then you've got maybe another row of panels that come along and they're also connected to the inverter. That's the typical system that you would see installed on homes, most of the homes that are around Sydney uh, that have had systems installed over the, uh, you know, the last sort of 10 or more years, that's what you're likely to see. So string inverters are very good, they operate well and you know, they're very efficient. Uh, and so if you've got good sunlight and you wanna keep your, you know, your purchase price uh, within a sort of affordable range, um, then a string inverter is a good option. Yeah, and there's an example there, Fronius. It's on the left there. It's a box that gets mounted on the wall, typically right next to your meter box. The box beside that, the small unit there, is called a micro inverter, and that's represented in the green diagram on the right there. So the way micro inverters operate is that they actually convert the DC to AC directly underneath the solar panel using one of these small boxes. It's a micro inverter, and then what happens is you bring those cables down into the home as 240 volt. And there's some benefits to those. Uh, and there's a hybrid kind of system there, which we call optimizers, whereby you have individual control on each of the panels. That's in the lilac or purple box at the bottom. And then you have an inverter as well. So that's a bit of a hybrid. There's, there's sort of pros and cons. Let me describe what they are. So with a string inverter, it's a tried and true technology. It's been around for a long time. So inverters like mine, I installed 18 years ago, um, they had an efficiency of about sort of 92%, 93%. Today's inverters are more like 99% efficient. That means all the electricity passing through it, a very small amount is lost in the converting process. Um, so they're cheaper to buy. Uh, you, you can't monitor individual panels when you buy a string inverter, but you know often you just don't need to. Um, so the, the one drawback is, you know, if there's an underperforming panel, you know, you're probably not going to see that, but it may have an impact on the whole string. So that's why those sort of micro inverters or, or optimized inverters have really come into the market. So the good thing about those individual controlled panels is that you can detect issues. It's one of the things that you can uh, you can do. Um, you've got greater flexibility on how you lay the panels out on the roof. Um, it's a bit more expensive to buy that technology because you're buying multiple small inverters rather than one larger one. Um, and the great thing about it is if you've got a small roof space or shading, then you can really make the most of the power that's been generated because a single panel that might not be performing well because of shade or the like or, or poor performance isn't going to affect the output of the rest. What to look for with panels? Well, basically, um, this is a technology box and you want it to be operating at its best. You want to get the best result you can from it. Um, you know, these things are often you know, encased in dark colored boxes. We don't know what's inside. Well, it's all electrics is what it is. You know, we've got a lot of gadgets in, in our home and we trust that they're going to operate. What I would encourage you to do, you need to be getting a good quality inverter. If you want to make some compromise on some of the components, Maybe, and you know, maybe you can step off the highest quality panels and step down into the middle of the range, but please don't make the mistake of buying a cheap inverter. It's one of the things that uh, you know I've seen, and certainly the guy that I've worked with on and off over the years, he spends a lot of time replacing cheap inverters that have failed. And if you get one that's been badged up cheap, that's come from uh, you know a, another supplier and has been rebadged, you'll probably be replacing it sometime down the track. 
uh, as opposed to a good quality inverter like this one. This one's made by a company called SMA. They're a German brand, got a very good uh, reputation and a 10 year warranty. Um, here's a list of some of the sort of larger manufacturers of inverters. Uh, it's not a comprehensive list, but you know, these are some of the good ones. Selectronic is one that I use. Uh, they're based in Victoria, uh, but you know, those are, there's, there's a number of them out there. Uh, so let's learn about the other elements. So size, we already sort of started this conversation, didn't we? So basically, you're probably not going to be installing a massive system like this unless you live under a warehouse roof, um, or perhaps if you're in a, you know, a, a large set of apartment, um, an apartment complex, maybe. Uh, but, you know, typically homes are sort of going for that sort of larger size systems that we talked about before, 20 odd panels um, in that sort of six to seven kilowatts um, sort of range. And that might be 20, 330 watt panels. It might be, you know, uh, if you're buying 350 watts, it, you know, might get you a slightly larger. Um, and my advice to you is it's okay to slightly oversize your system. It may be that you'll transition away from some of those other fuels that you currently use. Perhaps you're even considering an electric car. So having an oversized solar power system is a good idea. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, how much do they cost? Well, basically, if you're going to buy a system and you're looking at getting one that is a decent quality system, one that you can rely on, and I know you might be saying to me, hang on a minute, fella, I've seen some advertising lately. Uh, you know, I can buy these big systems for under $4,000. Oh, there's a famous cricketer on TV or comes up on my gadget telling me so. Um, yeah, well, that famous cricketer won't be installing and they probably won't be there when you go to chase up a warranty some years later. Okay, uh, our advice to you is you should be looking at buying something you can trust is going to last on your roof. So we say a good quality system is what you want to be investing in. You're going to recover the money quite quickly. It's worth buying the better gear. So if you're looking at just sort of a basic string inverter system, you, you know, a five kilowatt system is going to cost you somewhere in the range of sort of five to $6,000. It's a bit over a dollar a watt. Uh, if you're going for the micro inverters, if you want that sort of control over individual panels, uh, then you're looking at a bit dearer price tag, seven and a half to nine and a half thousand dollars. Um, and those prices that I've listed there, that already includes the government's rebate, which is a, which we call them STCs for short, small scale technology certificates. That that rebate program has been in place for some time now, since 2016. It's going to continue. It's been, uh, you know, it's it's going to continue out to the year 2030, uh, assuming we you know, keep our politics and politicians on a federal level stable. Um, you know, rebates do change, uh, and sometimes they change around election times, which is interesting to watch over the years. Uh, but look, what we're saying is for about a five kilowatt system, you're going to enjoy about you know, $2,250 back from the federal government. That rebate does decline by about 7% each year, but that's not a big enough amount. It you know, represents a few hundred dollars. So you know, don't be rushed into it before Christmas under high pressure. However, I I'd encourage you to step into this market. Uh, certainly, you're you're online now, listening. I think you're interested. It's it's well and truly in your in your interest to follow it up. Um, there's been a little bit of talk about a solar tax, you know, like actually having to pay a fee for generating electricity and putting it in the grid. Look, um, this is really just under sort of what's going on is that our grid has to change. Our electricity grid was designed that there were big players pushing electricity into the grid and it was distributed out to homes and businesses. But what's going on now is homes are now generating electricity and businesses. And so our grid's becoming a two-way street and it was never designed for that. Our whole electricity grid was paid for by taxpayers over many years. Um, and so what's going on is that there's a discussion with those sort of regulators and those, those bodies that look after our national grid. They're talking about how do we fund the upgrading of our grid? And so it's just an initial proposal and it certainly wouldn't be a factor you know, even if there was a small tax that would come in, I love the way that tax becomes the thing that everyone's fearful of. Um, it would be probably over time a very small fee to help pay for the upgrade of that network. So it's not going to affect your payback time, you know, and it's certainly not a reason to consider not going ahead. Like it's a small, it's a small player and only under discussion at this point in time. And even when it does come in, it's not going to be a big impact. All right, position. Uh, where should you put solar panels? Well, really, uh, in a perfect world, and if you're someone who lives off grid like me, you would face them north and you would tilt them up at a high azimuth, which means for someone like me who's running directly off batteries and only off batteries, I need that power even in the winter months when we get the sun's on a low arc. And you could see from the diagram there, you know, east and west. Uh, total, there's, there's a different sort of amount of sunlight you get in summer and in winter. 
uh, because we know the winter sun does a low arc in the sky and the summer sun is right up overhead and for many more hours. But your solar power system, even though it will be producing more electricity in summer, is actually impacted by heat. It will reduce the amount of energy that it produces because of heat. So, you know, what we would say, north is ideal, but east and west is okay. Um, if you don't have a steep roof or 30 odd degree roof, it's fine because even if solar panels are sort of anywhere between about 22 and a half degrees off their ideal access, axis, they're still producing something in the order of about 90, 90, 90 something percent of their output. So, um, you know, basically any sort of roof, roof angle uh, for the most part in that sort of range is, is, you know, typically going to be quite productive. If you need, um, you know, energy first thing in the morning, east facing panels are good. If you need it in the afternoon to run air conditioning, for, for example, then west facing is good. But north is sort of year round power production. Uh, and finally, uh, let's talk a bit about suppliers, what to look for. Okay, so you want someone who's been in the market for a long time, someone who's got good reviews, uh, make sure that it's a professional quote. Um, the, the accreditation body is called the Clean Energy Council. So if you're going to be a solar installer, you have to be accredited with the Clean Energy Council. Uh, and so they have a second tier, which they call the uh, Approved Solar Retailer. So for those people who want to step up in, into the market, um, insofar as supplying, then they tend to take up they go over that higher hurdle and we would suggest you want a five-year installation warranty a guarantee on the workmanship getting a quote initially what's going to happen is they're going to uh, you know just talk to you over the phone they're going to ask you about your electricity bills that tends to be the first thing how much electricity do you use now fortunately you've come to tonight's presentation and there's a number that's going to stick in your mind and and that is that in Sydney, we produce just under, it's 3.9, but we're just, for, for simple mathematics, we're going to round it off to four hours of production a day, averaged out across the whole year. Yes, we get about 100 days of rainy weather, but there's many hundreds of days where we get good sunny weather. So about four hours of production each day on average. Now, if you put in a five kilowatt system, by four hours, you're making 20 kilowatt hours. So how does that relate to your electricity bill? Well, somewhere on your electricity bill, there will be an at the average kilowatt hours used per day. And my advice to you is get a few electricity bills, find out what that average is. And, you know, tally up your winter, your spring, your autumn and your summer bills. Tally up that figure, divide it by four. Now, now you know what your annual average daily usage is and you wanna try and size your system up. So if you are using in that sort of 20 kilowatt range, then a five kilowatt system will adequately cover your electricity use. And if you want to make it a little bigger, it will also cover things like, you know, the little fee you pay each day back to the network, you know, your connection fee, those kind of things. Um, but yeah, basically, that's the first thing they're going to ask you when you talk to an installer. They're going to say, hey, um, tell me your address. I can look you up using sort of satellite technology. I've got some, you know, uh, I've got some tools here that can allow me to sort of size a system up based on, your roof space and you can see from the picture there this is the kind of the blue boxes there is is kind of what the software that they use can do for you uh, and so basically they'll ask you about your electricity use uh, and then they'll come up with a bit of a quote online and probably then make a site visit with you uh, so a lot of people are interested in batteries yeah so batteries are certainly having a, a, a bigger impact uh, and so um, we've got a bit of a, a, an example here of batteries why solar why a battery? Um, so, you know, people are going for, there's certainly been a lot of uh, enjoyment uh, and excitement in the market about, uh, you know, players like Tesla who have come along. Uh, and so Tesla's built some fairly large, uh, you know, systems. What they've decided is they'll build an all-in-one box rather than having multiple sized systems. They've sort of decided, well, what does the average household actually use outside of those sunny hours of production? And the average that a household uses is around about 13, 13 and a half kilowatts. It's about, you know, 70 odd percent of the energy is in that morning peak and evening peak, rather than when we're actually, you know, producing electricity during the middle of the day. Now that's of course, those, those sort of calculations were done, you know, before COVID came around and before we were all spending our days at home on our own computers. Um, but basically, you know, Tesla's built this box, something like a 13 and a half kilowatt battery storage. And, and in this instance, um, this particular house uh, installed 15, LG panels. Um, they use those micro inverters. Hey, um, Ian. In phase, yes. Ian, just, just to interrupt. Tinny is actually here to talk to talk to this because this is Tinny's house. Can I just Excellent. introduce Tinny? Do you want to go back to the slide before as well? Thank you. Sure. Let's go, Tinny. 
Okay, sorry about Ian, I'm sure you do a, a, a much better job. So I've been invited tonight to just kind of share our story, how we ended up with the solar system. Um, we've always wanted one, but we never had uh, the house to put it on. Um, that changed earlier this year. We've had a, an e-cargo bike as our mode of transport for a while. My mum and dad have it, had a solar system for the last 15 years. So once we got the opportunity, we decided to do it. And we kind of didn't even do much research. We thought batteries are around um, and we really, really like the idea of um, being sort of off the grid. Um, and we just took the plunge and looked at this and I, in Ian's presentation before I saw that um, my husband, um, without my knowledge, actually talked us into the, the top range uh, solar panels in this process. <laughs> so I should say our house is pretty much like what Dave um, described in the chat before. It's a south facing semi with um, west and east um, to the front and back. So by any standard, definitely not ideal, but we didn't let, it, let that deter us. And I'm actually really glad that we did that. Um, if we, I could maybe get the next slide. So what we did install was 15 of these panels. So the total capacity is just over five kilowatts. Um, we went with the micro, micro inverters and we got the Tesla Powerwall. Um, there's other batteries as well. This one, from all I can tell, it looks very sleek. Um, and what we kind of didn't expect is that you inherit a few extra boxes next to your uh, power board as well. So there's one for the Tesla battery and the one that you see in the picture on the right is what comes with the actual solar system. System. What we didn't know at the time is that it's actually a good idea to get your power board assessed to make sure whether it can hold all the extra bits and pieces, because we actually had ours just replaced um, two weeks ago, um, because it couldn't connect all of this, which means we weren't able to export into the grid until two weeks ago, which means the next slide that I'm going to show you just shows um, the benefits without being able to export anything. So when you look at these numbers, keep in mind, uh, South Face semi so we've got two panels that are facing west two are facing east and the other 11 are on the uh, south facing side nonetheless um, our electricity bill four of us at home uh, non-stop so this is lockdown and it's um, the coldest and least sunniest quarter of the year we had a total electricity bill of 290 for a family of four um, and you can see how quickly that changes so first week of september we were well and truly into being being completely off the grid and powered by just solar and the battery. Um, and now, um, just a month later, we produce a lot more energy than we can use. Um, there's something strangely rewarding to be completely off the grid. And just to give you an idea, even on a day like today, we haven't used any electricity from the grid quite yet. So our solar panels stopped producing even on a very rainy day about 20 minutes ago, and it'll probably see us through until about maybe four o'clock this in the morning until we have to start using um, electricity, but most of the time we don't need any at all. So that's fantastic. But there's also a few unexpected benefits that come from having the system. So number one, um, when power gets interrupted, planned or unplanned, we actually have backup power. Just recently, we had a full day power outage because a power pole needed to be replaced. It didn't affect us at all. Um, we can actually um, charge the battery ahead of time um, from the grid as well if we want to or if it's a rainy day and, and the sun wouldn't actually charge it up enough. So that's been really great. Another unintended consequence is we became a lot more energy smart. So the battery comes with a very uh, funky app. And what you see on the right is energy usage. So as soon as you plug in an appliance or turn it on, you can immediately see what that actually means for your el electricity consumption. And it has certainly helped us to be a lot more aware and potentially change our behavior. So for example, we put the washing on when we know that we produce a lot more energy than we could ever use. And we might be mindful of turning on heat lamps and electric heaters and that kind of stuff in the middle of the night. So um, they're, they're the unexpected uh, benefits. Here are some of the, the technicalities, but I think that's very much in line with what Ian said in terms of um, the cost and, and the, the battery. I have to say, we didn't necessarily do it for financial benefits. We're mainly driven by the idea of being off the grid, but the, the financial benefits are substantial. And now with these two weeks of being able to export again with our south facing semi, um, we even make back the daily connection fees. So it's, it's, it's a really rewarding exercise all up. 
I think there's one more slide, if I remember correctly or I not. I think we've come to no, that. That's no, that's it. <laughs> Ah, that's why you got confused, Ian, because it's it's exactly the, the same battery. Um, I should maybe add one more thing, um, a couple of things that I wish I'd known going into this. So we were really worried about how the panels would look at the front and the back of our house. Um, and before the year's out, we're actually going to put two more at the front and the back because it's east and west facing, and that's where we get most of the um, electricity from. And the other thing that I would say when we first started looking into this, it's a little bit of a foreign language that solar panel providers and electricity providers and electricians and everyone else has to come together um, talks. Um, just hear them all out. Once you've spoken to the various stakeholders involved, it all starts to make sense. And um, for us, the, the solar panel provider was really helpful and, and um, sort of ran the show for us a little bit. So if I have my time again, I would say go as big as your roof will hold, especially if you do have a battery. Um, and it's been a really enjoyable and, and rewarding experience for us. Great. Thanks, Tinny. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, look, it's uh, you know wonderful to have that direct insight. You know, uh, so uh, thank you. Yeah, I I I uh, I've experienced many of those things. One of the things that I really like too, just for a moment there, we had uh, your electricity bill up, and it showed your average daily usage. I should have referred to that slide earlier. Hey, um, basically, what's going on is battery storage is growing, and that's one of the things that's really um, helping us uh, into this. And Australia is one of those countries that's our, our big take up of solar. We're actually the world is looking at us, uh, and we're one of the countries that's you know really there are many. Many uh, battery manufacturers in our market are really encouraging us. Now, you can see from a very small starting point back in 2015, we've seen great increase 2016, 17, 2018, uh, sort of petered off a little bit 2019 and, tw and 2020. Um, look, you know, what's going on is that batteries are actually getting smarter, they're getting safer. Uh, and so there's a certain amount of expenditure going on in building those sort of extra smarts and extra uh, safety measures in. So we would have liked to have seen them become cheaper and the, you know, the, the sort of market explode. Um, I, I expect as we'll see some more in the future, uh, things like um, government rebates and the, and the like come along. And as I said, election cycles tend to help in those kind of matters. But you know, batteries storage is definitely growing uh, and so some some the basic idea here is which I, you know I think Tinny's already sort of um, alluded to uh, I want you to just briefly look at this graph you can see there's sort of a gray line it's like a double camel's hump what you're looking at there is the average uh, household's energy use across one day from early in the morning till late at night and the idea here is that you know we use a, a lump of power in the mornings which is you know that sort of greeny colored uh, the tur turquoisey kind of colored to the left uh, and we use a bigger amount again in the evenings. But when we produce solar power, it tends to be in the middle of the day. And so what's been going on is, of course, um, we are, we're able to use a bit in our typical electricity cycle, which is the, the pale is sort of green in the middle there. Um, but the yellow section has been going to waste or going out to the grid, actually, for a small feed-in tariff. And so the battery market says, well, hang on a minute. Let's make use of that. Let's capture some of that solar power, put it in the battery, and then you can bring it back at night. And particularly um, if you're on those kind of feed-in tariffs, uh, sorry, if you're on those kind of time of use tariffs where you pay a higher rate for electricity in the evenings, then this is a really uh, great consideration. So storing some of that daytime energy that would have other, otherwise gone out to the grid for a low fee and putting it into your battery and then bringing it back at night when you would otherwise be paying a really high fee. So that's how batteries, that's the kind of, that's the theory, that's how batteries work. Um, financial return on batteries. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a proposition that needs to work uh, on your numbers or indeed if you're somebody like Tinny who says, hey, I, you know, I'm, an, I'm an early adopter. I want to see this market grow. I'm going to invest here because I think this is a, the right thing to do. Uh, and also, you know, that sense of like having control over your energy, which is something that I, I strove for as well. You know, so the idea is that um, if you were to look at batteries purely on an economic basis, um, you, you might very well be sort of deciding that batteries may or may not be the right thing for you today or, or, or right now or this month or this year, but in the very near future, I assure you they will be. Um, the idea here is that you can see in that first statement, you can expect to reduce your bills by 60 to 90% with solar and batteries. That equation relies very heavily on the solar component. Um, when you're talking about how much energy you're actually storing and how much it costs you for each kilowatt hour, it sort of ranges between $1,000 and $2,000 for each kilowatt hour. And if I did the math, you know, how many light bulbs is that? Well, you know, 10 bright light bulbs running for an hour is a kilowatt hour. So, you know, if you've got a big battery, um, you know, then it's quite an expensive way to store energy. However, 
However, it does have great benefits. So at the moment, the cost of batteries, although we were hoping they would get cheaper and cheaper as years go by, and I expect, you know, when we reach those economies of scale, and if there are any kind of subsidy that comes along to help us, then um, we would see this, this particular point, you know, improve. But at the moment, the payback period on batteries is about 10 years, and that's very close to the warranty period. Um, there's a couple of examples on the right-hand side there. Enphase makes some smaller batteries, you know, like drawers, and you install multiple of them to get a big enough battery to do the task you want. Tesla's got the all-in-one product, um, and LG does a number of different sizes, and there's just a few different sort of sample prices there for you to look at. Why are people installing batteries? Well, I think Tinny sort of covered, you know, a number of those reasons. Energy independence, yay. Uh, backup power, you know, if you're getting, you know, if there's going to be an out outage, you know, it's, it's a great outcome. You can keep a number of things running. And if, you know, particularly, you know, one of the things that really bites people is when the fridges go off and all your freezers uh, start to, everything's thawing out in the freezer. So if you could wire up those circuits so that they can stay on attached to batteries, very good. Um, some people just want to do it because they want to be part of a sustainable future. Uh, and that's really, you know, that idea of being an early adopter, pushing the technology and seeing that growth. Um, if we waited for governments to make decisions, we might be waiting a long time. But while you can reach into your own pocket and pay for this technology, that drives an enormous message out to the market. And so it's really important to make those decisions. Um, and also to be part of uh, virtual power plants. That's the sort of thing that's coming up. You can actually join up with other people who have batteries. Uh, you can join companies that actually buy and sell electricity out of your battery when the market is really high. And so these virtual power plants is one of those phenomena that's going to help bring down the cost of batteries and enable that battery to help stabilize our electricity grid as well, which is another benefit. How do you choose the right battery? Well, uh, there's a great website you can have a look at, smartenergy.org.au, Battery Finder. Uh, so they uh, have some good information there. It's worth having a trawl through that. Warranties, you want at least a 10-year warranty. Sometimes they talk about cycles, uh, but, you know, 10 years is what you're looking for. Uh, a cycle tends to be you know, the idea is that, you know, you sort of draw power out of the battery in a day and you put it back, uh, you know, the next day. Uh, and so that's a, that's a single cycle. So one a day would be 365 cycles and a year would be 3,650 over 10 years. Um, the usable capacity is really about how much energy you can store in a battery uh, and how much you need for your purposes. Is it just to keep fridges and lights running? Um, it's unlikely that even a fairly big battery is going to be able to run a whole house for days on end. It's only going to be able to run some of those appliances uh, for a period of time. So you need to actually understand how much is available to you through that battery. That's called usable capacity. And you need to have a conversation with your installer, with the you know, person providing the quotes to you. Uh, and if you do want it for backup power, then you need to have that conversation as well, because that sometimes means you've got a slightly different set of choices uh, insofar as the technology, like the inverters. It may be that you want a hybrid inverter that manages a battery and the grid. Um, and so there's a, a little conversation you need to have if you want it for backups, for blackouts and those kind of things. Look, if you're not ready for batteries, what should you do to prepare for batteries? Well, the basic thing is, you know, buying solar is the simple method that you can do straight up. It's the simple, sensible choice to go for straight away. And, you know, it's a bit of it, like, to be honest, it's a bit of a no-brainer. You're going to recover your money very quickly and you're going to bring your electricity bills down and you're going to enjoy free electricity for a long period of time. Um, even back in the day when I installed my system 18 years ago, it was, I was looking, I did the calculations based on my bills. It was looking at going to pay it, take 19 years to pay off. But what I've seen over that period is electricity prices have tripled. So, you know, I can happily say that I paid my system off and I actually do get free electricity. It's falling out of the sky. Um, if you're not ready for batteries, then put on the big solar system now. The Real Estate Institute of Australia will tell you that, you know, houses that have photovoltaics on them, large photovoltaic systems sell faster. I mean, this is a good asset to have on your property. Uh, you can always add the battery later. We've got some guides on our website. So again, I'd encourage you to have a look at our website, AEF, AustralianEnergyFoundation.com.au for homes, solar power. There's a guide there on panels, a guide there on batteries. Please take a look at those. Um, briefly, I'm just going to step through the things that we've talked about tonight. Um, key takeaways, why install solar? It's a really good return on investment. You know, the payback period in our region is really good. Uh, how do you get the right system? Um, reputable, re buying reputable gear, good panels, good inverters, you know, a good clean energy council approved solar retailer and install a big system. If you've got the roof space available, go big. Yeah. I, and I don't, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, factory size solar. It needs to be somewhat matched up to your needs. And that's going back to your electricity bills. We talked about that earlier. And that magic number four, 
but you know a five kilowatt system would be you know what we would sort of encourage for a full household uh, and going bigger six or seven is a good idea too what about batteries look battery storage as we discussed energy independence uh, it'll give you solar power at night if you need it if you're not ready you can install the power the solar power now and add the batteries later because a lot of them are what they call ac coupled you can install the battery after the fact and you just get another box to help control that process uh, council has some offerings here now do i do i have somebody who in council yes, who wants to talk about this yes <laughs> Ian, that's rachel again i'm happy to run through this sure so if you're lucky enough to live in Randwick Council, they've got an amazing sustainability rebates program. So you can get a solar rebate up to $500 for a house, up to $1,000 for a unit or a business, and up to $2,000 for a shared unit block, which is wonderful. Uh, there's, they also have a rebate for the battery up to $500. Uh, if you already have an existing system, they do a solar health check just to see if there's any maintenance or upgrades that need to happen. And there's a rebate for up to $100. And really importantly, uh, to look at energy efficiency as well, if you would like an assessment on that uh, to work out where, how to reduce your energy consumption as well as putting the solar on, it's a $150 rebate. Uh, so Wallara Council and Waverley Council both have similar uh, programs that support uh, apartment blocks uh, and look at the common areas and, and also look at solar feasibility for those apartments. So Wallara Council has applications open um, until the end of November and we will send some information out following uh, this webinar with some of these links. Uh, the Waverley Council program, we've just selected five buildings for this financial year, but we'll have another round next year. And just to note that we have a solar my club initiative that runs across the three council areas as also a solar my schools program, which has been very successful. So we support uh, a free solar assessment quotes and implementation support for clubs such as tennis clubs or uh, the surf life-saving clubs and this program is hopefully being expanded uh, into churches synagogues and other sort of business types so stay tuned for that um, and there's currently uh, yeah no fees involved uh, for the solar component of DAs so that's all from uh, the presentation side of thing. We've got about six minutes left for some questions. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Angus, for uh, replying to a lot of those questions in the chat. I've just picked a few interesting ones out. Um, uh, this one's for you probably, Ian. Larry okay. has said um, that he's trying to get eight townhouse owners to join up and install a sole share system um, but many of the owners are concerned with the roof leaking and potential leaks in the membrane and destroyed roof tiles how big a problem is this really great good question look i've installed a lot on uh, a lot of systems on on tiled roofs so if the tiles are really old uh, and we particular i remember you know one instance installing on a really hot day but as the day progressed towards the middle of the day uh, more and more of the tiles that we're working on were cracking. Uh, so look, it tends to be that um, if the roof is very old, it's worth your while sort of uh, trying to hunt down a few spare tiles. What happens with installers is that uh, they'll arrive first thing in the morning, usually, you know, around seven or a bit before seven. Uh, they'll measure up on the roof. And what they do is they work along the tile rows uh, pushing some tiles up in order to fit the brackets that mount the railing systems. Now, very quickly, you'll assess whether or not the, the roof's fragile. That'll happen, you know, first thing in the morning, uh, you know, when you're starting this workout. And so, uh, you know, what tends to happen is you, you'll then say to the owner, look, we've got a couple of tiles that are cracking up here. Do you have any spares? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to move those cracked tiles down the roof and we'll replace them with some better tiles that right down so perhaps over something that's not as a, not as critical a porch or something like that um if it's possible if it's a very small crack you can just put some silicon on it and it'll it'll survive for it's for, for quite a time um you can chase up secondhand tiles as well look if it's a tin roof just no problem most solar installers today try not to do penetrations through the roof so you can run the cabling externally in conduit uh and so you know rather than having the risk that you know five or ten years from now you can get sort of water egress or leakage you know most installers will just run external cabling so that they're not making penetration so you don't have to worry about that um the brackets on sort of tin roofs uh, sorry on on tiled roofs are, are kind of like a it's like a gooseneck you install it underneath the tile and then you pull the tile back over it you usually grind a little bit of the tile away so there's no leakage installing the brackets which carry the rails which the solar panels go on 
Uh, there, there won't be any leakage under those other than just a few possible cracked tiles. Metal roofs, it's even simpler. You get a drill and pull out, a drill, pull out the screw. You put a bracket down and then you put a slightly larger screw back in its place and it's done. And there, you know, there's no leakage on, on those systems. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. You could have someone come and give you a, a bit of a look and an assessment about it, uh, you know, but, you know, for the most part, it's, it's never been a consideration that stopped an installer putting panels on uh, unless you've got slate. That's a bit of a different situation. Slate is very expensive uh, and most uh, most solar installers will probably steer away from it because you, know, you need a specialist to replace and fix slate. And it also might very well then come under a heritage consideration. So that, that employs, that, you know, that, that brings in some other considerations. Thanks, Ian. That does link to a question from Steve. Do I need a DA in a heritage area? Um, According to Waverley Council, where I work, as we interpret the infrastructure set, which uh, it, it, we we interpret it that solar is exempt from a DA in a heritage area as long as it does not face a primary road and is, it is flush mounted. Um, but uh, Wallara Council recommends ringing the duty planner there. We'll send some information out to you uh, this evening or early tomorrow with um, information on that. Um, Tini, we have a question for you. Uh, do the fees that you quoted or your cost, did that include the cost of the electrician and the installers, the solar installers? Yeah, it was all fully installed. Um, as a, a, The only thing that happened, we had a fairly old um, power board, which meant that the smart meter simply didn't have space in it. So we then had the option of either sort of butchering the existing power board or actually taking the opportunity to replace it completely. And we decided to replace and that was an extra cost, but I think that was quite unusual for our situation, but usually it's fully installed. So the, the price that we got on the quote was literally, as Ian said, they show up at seven o'clock in the morning. There was a little bit of sort of extra fiddling with the, with the power boards the next day to get it all hooked up. but. Um, it's, it's very unintrusive, not even noisy. Great, thank you, Tinny. Uh, just probably two more quick questions. Um, sure. Ian, I thought this was an interesting one. How do you know if it is a cheap inverter? That was from Nagari. Yeah, look, um, uh, look, I, I it, it's got to be, I, I would encourage you to be getting someone, uh, getting an inverter from a company that has a local office. Uh, if there's not a, a local, you know, like a local, it's, if, it's, if the company doesn't have a, an office in Australia, but maybe not necessarily in Sydney, at least if they've got one in Melbourne or, you know, maybe in Brisbane. But um, if they don't have any local representation, I tend to steer clear. And the larger players do have uh, that kind of representation. The people that you buy your panels and your system from are usually buying from wholesalers. The wholesalers are, you know, are importing this stuff, uh, you know, en masse, but, you know, in some instances, the larger manufacturers uh, will have a presence, a local office. Uh, so um, there was, uh, you know, you can come and have a look at our website. There's a guide there that talks about, you know, the various types of systems. Um, and there's a few resources out on the internet, including the Clean Energy Council has a number of sort of resources. They're the accreditation body. Um, uh, you know, if it's if the name isn't recognisable, um, you know, if it's uh, perhaps even a badged up. So many years ago when solar panels were first going on, uh, you know, uh, under the sort of rush of various state government incentives, sort of eight to 10 years ago, a lot of very cheap inverters came into the market and went onto people's homes. And those were often rebadged. There was actually the name of the inverter had a sticker or a, or a little plate stuck over it. Uh, and those inverters would fail fairly quickly. And the guy I work for spends one to two days a week going around replacing those inverters. And the companies that installed them aren't around. Uh, and there was, you know, there was never a local office that you could try and chase it up. So if you if you've got good, uh, you know, good good uh, language skills, and you can you know have a conversation with someone on uh, one of our neighbouring <laughs> countries, you know, perhaps in China or in, you know uh, or in India, then maybe you can follow up one of those cheaper inverters. But if you stick with one of those larger, better known brands, LG, uh, uh, you know, people like Fronius, uh, SMA, um, Selectronics, there was a few on that example. But there's a few resources out there you can go and find on the net, including the Australian Energy Foundation. So give us a ring; we can help you with that. Well, that's perfect. I think uh, we've reached our, our hour up. And so I'd just like to thank you, Ian, for such an informative presentation. And no Tinny, for sharing your real life experience. That's extremely valuable for us. And thank you all for attending. And I wish you all the best. We will be in touch with a list of resources. And uh, hopefully you'll be uh, move, able to move further along on your solar journey after this. So thank you, everybody. Good night. Great. Thank you. Good night.